here. Of course, in our news and notes, there's always our, our list of uh, prayers that we want to remember people by. And one of the things Marion and I were talking about uh, the other day was the number of anniversaries we have listed in our news and notes. So you have to look down through there. Uh, the month of May is coming up, and uh, there's a bunch of uh, anniversaries, which we say congratulations to all of those. Uh, it's always good to see that type of thing out there. Let's start our class with a word of prayer. So you'll pray with me, please. Father in heaven, we come before you thanking you for the blessings you give to us each day. And this day, Heavenly Father, is the blessing that we are here. And the blessing of the gathering of your body. And we pray that you be with us this day as we look at your word and we understand what you'd have us to believe and to work with. Heavenly Father, we bring before you the listing of our prayers, all the members of our body here, and those that need healing, those who need comforting, those who have had loss. And Heavenly Father, we pray that you comfort them, heal them, and give them what they have need of, if it be thy will. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the word that you've given to us that we might look at ourselves to understand, to open our ears, and to open our eyes that we see your will. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> I think I got a little allergy stuff this morning, so pardon me if my uh, cough kind of goes on. Uh, it's that time of year, isn't it? Where we are in uh, 1 Timothy, of course, uh, here we're moving on, and Paul is trying to instruct this young minister. And, of course, as we've talked before, this young minister is one that has... Um, moved with Paul. He worked with Paul. He traveled with Paul. He was an assistant. I can see him carrying in a backpack the uh, parchments, the books, uh, some of the clothing, the things that Paul would do in traveling from place to place. He's a young man. He's able to do this physically. But he had other men that would also work with him and help there too. But Paul was a worker, as we know. And that's very, very important. So we want to take that example as we have, and that's what these writings are about. Last week we talked about the leadership development in the church. Timothy and Titus and many others, Barnabas and Silas, they set and appointed elders in each church that they worked with. They did that to make sure that the church had a good, strong backbone, if you will. And so they established elders for the leadership and the oversight of the congregation in the spiritual mode, but the deacons that we see him listing here were the men who stepped forward to do some of the physical work that needs to do, be done as the church was in the uh, development stages. The work that had to be done, sometimes simply in feeding families or clothing or maybe even helping them get back and forth to uh, services. We, we, we have all kinds of lists that we can make up in our minds because we read through the scripture and we see people working and it's all kinds of work that we have here. We're going to read from uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to start in verse 14 and we're going to read down through verse 16. Now this morning I've split this up into these two sections because the first portion of it is addressing Timothy and he's going to talk to about their conduct and then we're going to read in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and those first five verses. So Evelyn's going to read the uh, chapter 3, 14 through 16 for us and we're going to move on and later when I have chapter 4 come up I'll have Gene read that portion for us. So, Evelyn, if you would uh, read. Thank you. Although I hope to come to you soon, I am writing you these instructions so that if I am delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. Beyond all question, the mystery of godliness is great. He appeared in a body, was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, was believed on in the world, was taken up in glory. Thank you. What I put up on the screen this morning, I have on one side there on the left is the King James Version of that reading. And on the right hand side, I have the New International Version. And as you look and compare those two, they are very, very similar. The wording slightly different because it's more modern English as opposed to King James that was written and translated back in 1611. So sometimes people don't quite get 
those little nuances, but they are there. But they both read the same. Uh, in the New International Version, he uses the concept that I hope to come to you soon. I am writing these things, these instructions, so that if I'm delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household. So it's very important. This is what Paul is trying to get Timothy to do. He's trying to establish leadership. But at the same time, in these verses, he ends this portion of the chapter, as man has broken these into chapters, he tells him right up front, this is the reason I'm writing this to you. I would like to come to be with you, you know. I bet if I go around the room this morning and I were to ask you, is there anybody in your family or close friends that you would like to go visit right now? Dave's going back there. No, he doesn't. <laughs> but yes, we all have someone we would really like to visit. Um, Wally and Patty were looking at some of our books at the back of the building, and Sally has collected over all these years that she's done this work kind of the history of the church and it has all of our old bulletins and there was a listing that we were looking at this morning um, how we used to do things and had a list of all the men in the congregation that used to do all the different service works it was a big list there was a lot of people there and I told them I said I remember every one of those people and I even told them where they retired to where they moved to and it's one of those things that we have the memories and the contacts that mean something to us. And that's what we have here with Paul. So it's not just a light thing that he actually says, I hope to come to you soon. He really means this. At the time this was written, he had been uh, in, this, in the speculation of, of scholars, of course, he had been in Rome in prison for like two years. And when he wrote this, this was right after he had been released from Roman prison. So he wrote this. So he's trying to travel and he's trying to get back to Ephesus. But if you look at the map, if you will, of all the places that Paul traveled, taught, and established the church, traveling from Rome back to Jerusalem, in one way he would never make it back to Jerusalem because he would stop and see all these people as we read last week in Acts chapter 20. He traveled to these different places, and when he got to Miletus, uh, he mentioned, he says in there, I called for the elders of Ephesus, and they came to him there. And the emotional scene, you see them, that they were weeping, and they fell on his shoulders, and they took him and led him, and he departed on the ship. So it's very important we understand where Paul is when he talks to Timothy. He's doing this from not only his heart, but from the spirit. And these are the things we look at. In this conduct of the church that he's getting across to Timothy, we do look at this and we understand that, you know, in times past in the Old Testament, God had conduct for all his people, the way they were to act. And in our lesson book, of course, it describes a couple different people in there because it's an establishment in the Old Testament on how we are to reflect on what God really wants. A friend of mine, Joe, mentioned one time about if you want to see the details of how God wants us to behave and how he wants us to act, read the description on the building of the Ark of the Covenant. Read about the tapestry that was hung around the tabernacle and how detailed that was, and tell me that you don't understand that God wants something extra from people. It's not just good enough that I want to do it this way. That is not what God is asking for. He wants us to do it his way, and we have to bow to God's will and not our own. In our lesson, we find him talking about uh, Aaron's sons, as we know, and it all comes from this, that you may know how thou ought to behave thyself in the house of God. And this is truly what we're talking about. We are the house of God. We are in the house of God as we're together. In Leviticus chapter 10, we see this story and we know this story. Aaron's two sons, they were supposed to be the next generation of priests. And in the story, we find that they took their censers that hold, you know, the, uh, the, the uh, incense and they put fire therein, as it says. And he put fire there upon and offered strange fire before the Lord. 
which he had commanded them not to do. The fire was supposed to be taken from the altar that was there before. But they didn't do it that way. And what happened to them? What happened to Aaron's sons? They didn't make it. Yeah, that's, that's the easiest way to say it. They were actually consumed by fire, is what the story comes down, because they did not follow what God's command. The ritual for the incense bring is laid down in the book of Leviticus, and it is very detailed on how the priests were supposed to do this work. God was not pleased. And in these days of Moses' time, the concept is God had direct relationship with some of these people, and we see that effect. We see another one in here, 2 Second, uh, Samuel chapter 6. This has to do with the man, and we know this story, Huzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God, and he took hold of it, is what it says, for the oxen had shook it. In other words, they had loaded the ark in the back of a wagon. They were rolling it down the road. They were taking it back to uh, Jerusalem, and the oxen, it rolled the ark, and it was tipping over. Well, Uzzah, he's being a good guy. He reaches up, keeps the ark from falling. Verse 7, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against him, against Uzzah, and the Lord smote him there for his heir, and there he died by the ark of God. You see, we look at that as a standard. That he didn't really do anything bad, did he? He kept the ark from falling off into the road, and he put his hand up and touched it. We weren't supposed to touch the ark of God. And these are the things we have to look at. These are little nuances that we have to pay attention to, is what it is. Yes, Tressa. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, basically that's what he should have done, let it fall. Kind of thing. The Lord would take care of that kind of stuff. But the idea was they put him in a situation that he shouldn't have had to put his hand up in there, and that is it. It's how we conduct ourselves, it's how we behave ourselves is the context here. His, and his intentions were good. Yes. Well, God was testing their faith. Yeah, that's part of it. God was testing their faith in what they had to do. There's a whole story back set uh, backstory to this like they do nowadays. But you know, the idea here is what man has done to create a situation. And it is our conduct, it is our behavior that makes a difference. Uh, when I was studying this lesson this week, I mentioned to Mary, and I said, this was a struggle. Because there's so many examples in the scripture about these things. You know, and I was going from one to the other. I was bouncing off the wall almost to the point to get the right story and to follow the lesson that's laid out. One of the scriptures we see here, and this is, and I'll tell you who this is in a minute. For because they did not at first, the Lord our God made a breach upon us for what we sought him, not after the due order. Man, that's a, that's a bunch of words. That's King James, of course. In verse 15 of that same spot. And the children of the Levites bear the Ark of the Covenant upon their shoulders with the stabs thereof, as Moses commanding according to the word of God. All this is talking about is where they would have followed the commandment that Moses laid out. Uzzah would have never had to put his hand up for the Ark. But what God did, yeah, he made a breach upon us. And we sought him not after his due order. In other words, man did not follow what God told him to do. That breach was the concept that Uzzah had to put his hand up to hold up the ark. Whereas if they would have followed his words, and they would have built the ark, and they would have followed and carried the ark like they were supposed to, upon the shoulders of the Levites, as Moses had commanded them. There are orders that we can follow and there are things that we sometimes don't follow. Because we think of things like in the Galatian letter, Paul writes the term liberty in Christ. We don't have a whole bunch of thou's and thou shall nots in the, test, in the New Testament. We do this by conscience. That's why in the scriptures here in Timothy, he talks about pure conscience because it's up to each individual. It is not a matter of thou shalt and thou shalt not. 
The little picture here, of course, the two sons of Aaron, the idea of carrying the censer and the incense that went into it, and they're kind of pointing, okay, I don't have to use that fire. That's kind of what that illustration is in there, and they walk away, and we see what happened to them. And, of course, the illustration here, you can see uh, as a, he's laying on the ground, he had touched the ark, and all the people around him, they were not following what God wanted to be done. There's too many scriptures that give us directions where we go. In Exodus 25 and 12, we see these words. And thou shalt cast four rings of gold for it, and put them on the four corners thereof, and rings shall be in one side of it, and two rings on the other side of it. And thou shalt make staffs of shittim wood, and overlay them with gold. And thou shalt put the staffs into the rings by the sides of the ark, and the ark may be more with them. The staffs shall be in the rings of the ark, and they shall not be taken from it. And thou shalt put in the ark as the testimony which I shall give thee. All Old Testament stuff, right? What's the lesson for us? Is the idea of the testimony which I give thee. And that's what Paul is doing to Timothy. The Jews who became Christians were to learn from the law of Moses. They were to learn from the prophets. And they were to learn that God had certain standards. And we see the same thing. That's what we're supposed to learn from. How God wants certain standards. And this is what Paul writes to Timothy. The New Testament emphasizes proper conduct for us as individuals and our behavior in the body of Christ. In the Colossian letter, chapter 3, verse 17 and whatsoever ye do in the word or deed, deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. This is a very simple verse that we've used for years. We train this up with our children. Everything you do, word or deed, do all in the name of Jesus. We memorize that, don't we? But we have to remember there's more to that verse than just the memorization. It's the action of doing it. You know, what words come out of my mouth? What deeds do I do around everybody? In fact, in the news and notes, if you look on the front page, there's a really good article about what you say. Read through that. The author did a very good job of that. In the Corinthian letter, we've talked about this many times in the body of Christ. The idea that we have here in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 40 let all things be done decently and in order. And Paul wrote this in that 14th chapter of Corinthians about the actual worship service, how people came together, what they were doing as worship came together. And he wanted to make sure it's perfectly clear. Decently and in order. It's not be a, a interrupted thing. It's not something that everybody gets to do what they want to do. Everybody has to do it according to decent and orderly function. Paul writes these letters, and, and Gene had brought up a little note here. It says, these things I write unto thee, hoping to come to thee shortly, but if I tarry, yes, we read this. How we're supposed to act in the house of God, the household of God. What Gene was asking about was how the spirit involves this. And in that question that she was bringing up comes into the concept is, the spirit is leading Paul in his writing to Timothy. The Spirit is telling Paul what needs to be said about the idea of how we're to behave in the church of God. That's where this comes from. This is not simply Paul the Apostle decided, I need you to do this, this, and this. No, it's what the Spirit of God wants us to do, and that's what leads Paul in his writing to Timothy. That's really what it all comes down to. Peter makes the comment, and he writes it in his letter, about that holy men guided by the Holy Spirit, wrote these things. And he tells us this. So we know that Paul and Peter and Luke and Mark and Matthew, when they wrote their letters, they were being guided by the Holy Spirit to make it right. And that's what Paul has here in that same concept. The things that we have here, you know, should lead on to us to make sure that we're comfortable in what we do. In verse 15 that we get into here in chapter 3, it's a thesis of the letter 
is the conduct of our lives as Christians and our behavior in the church. This is on page 39 of our book. This is what the author writes out. Because it is a thesis. He's writing this to make sure that it is learned. It's a lesson that he wants us to know. Paul wishes to return to teach Timothy and the church as he had taught them from the beginning. Remember, Paul, you know, he was there at Ephesus. The church began. They went to the synagogue. He brought in many people, Jewish and the Greeks, men and women. And he had a desire to come back. If I were to ask somebody here, how long did Paul preach and teach in Ephesus? Anybody remember? Three years. Three years. You get to know somebody pretty good, being with them every day for three years? Yeah, that becomes a personal contact. So we can understand when he talks about his desire to come to them soon, he's not talking just to Timothy, he's talking about that whole body. Listed here in this scripture, it talks about the house of God. The church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth, God's family, and it's not a building, it's the people. You know, this building, does this building have contact, conduct? We know where we are. Does it have any conduct? Not really. It's a structure, people see it. And they see the building and it looks really nice. What is it they don't see sometimes are the people that make up the body of Christ? Or do they? And that's what we have to remember. We make a reflection on the church. Ephesus chapter 4, Paul writes here to the church at Ephesus, There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called, one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Now, one of the things that I try to emphasize, especially in our Monday night class when we do personal studies, how many churches are there? Pardon? Oh, there's a bunch of congregations out there. Yeah. But how many churches did, God, did Jesus establish? One. And everything you look through this scripture, you're seeing a singular action here. You're seeing, as it says in verse 4 and 5, one body, one spirit, one hope that you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. You see, this cuts into the idea of leadership and conduct. And we're going to lead that direction here in just a minute. In verse 16, Paul writes in this letter and what Evelyn had read, written, uh, read to us. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. Who's the person he's speaking of here? What person is he speaking of here? Who's this described? Jesus. Jesus, exactly. You see, this is Jesus. And parallel to this would be going back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. Very simple parallel. But what we have here is that mystery, as it talks about here. And if I were to ask some of the, the folks here at the church, is there a great mystery for us now? Or do we understand this? Now, we should understand it, because it was intended to us. But into the world... It's a mystery. They don't understand how we have this faith because they haven't heard the word of God. But part of the tommy is still a mystery to us because we don't know what we're going to get, you mm -hmm. know, where we're going or what's going to happen. So it still is a mystery to us. Yeah, it is. It's certainly not a mystery. But God has given us everything that we really need. Peter brings that up. We have everything we need for life and godliness, you know, to get us there. And is there a little mystery? Sure. I have not seen the face of God. I was not lucky enough like Moses to see in the backside of God. My faith is like that of Thomas. Jesus spoke to him. He says, you know, blessed are you that you've seen, you've touched. But more blessed are those who have never seen, but yet believe. And that establishes us. So we have to have that faith by those apostles. And 
the thing we have in here is I read through this. I broke it down individually uh, onto it. Because in the scriptures, as I said, this concept of this controversy, this Greek mystery, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the concept of that God was manifest in the flesh, read John chapter 1, verse 1. The Word of God. He was the Word. He is the Word. And we actually held Him and we touched Him. He's justified by the Spirit. Matthew chapter 3, we see the baptism of Christ. And at the baptism, we see the idea that the Spirit comes down, and then a voice comes down. This is my beloved Son. Hear ye Him. I am well pleased. Angels have seen Jesus. Yes, they have. Matthew chapter 26, verses or 28, verses 2, and then 5 and 6. The angels who came down rolled the stone away, saw Jesus actually raised from the dead. These are the things which we see. We have witnesses to that. That's what that gospel's for. Preached unto the Gentiles. Preach unto the Gentiles. You can go through the entire New Testament, the book of Acts especially, and read every epistle, starting with the Galatian letter, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and you see what I'm saying. Those are all Gentile churches in many ways. It was preached to the Gentiles. Matthew, or Acts chapter 10 in Acts chapter 10, the neat thing, and I put this here for a reason, is because Peter was called to go to the Gentiles to preach. And this is what we see, that first action of going strictly from the Jews in Jerusalem and the Judea area. This is the first time an apostle was sent by God to a Gentile family and his friends, as it says, to hear the word of God. And we see that nations now are broken into the Gentiles that they're spoken to and it's important we recognize those things and believed in the world Colossians chapter 1 6 verse 23 also very clearly talks about that idea of he was believed on that's where our faith comes from and then finally the concept received up in glory in the book of Luke we see in chapter 24 verse 451 we see him with the apostles, and as they are being taught by Jesus, he is taken up. And they see him rise into glory. And there were two men standing there, and they were telling them, Why are you men looking up? The same Jesus which you see raised here will also come again in the same manner. So these apostles were our witness to see these things. And this is what Paul is describing in these verses. He is instructing Timothy to use these things to correct false teaching. He wants to make sure that these things are taught, not what men attempt to teach. And that's important. The truth in contrast to false teaching and teachers. If I were to tell somebody to turn over to chapter 3 of James... Anybody tell me what verse 1 of chapter 3 of James says? Anybody remember that one? And if you want to look it up, that's okay. Chap verse 1. Chapter 3, verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. James, chapter 3. Yeah. Verse 1. Not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brother. Yeah, that's what it is. Yeah. James warns us not too many of you be teachers because teachers will be judged more harshly on what's being taught. And this is the thing we have to think about. You know, Paul teaches, Timothy teaches, Silas, Barnabas, Peter, John, they all taught. But more importantly, in this letter, we're talking about who is apt to teach in the churches. What description is there? We talked about last week. Who is the person who's supposed to be apt to teach? Say that again, Wally. John? The elders, yes. It's supposed to be apt to teach, the ability to teach. And that's what the responsibility bears on anyone who stands where I'm standing today. I want to go into chapter 4, if there's no 
questions about 14 through 16 here. Patterns are good, yes. on a cross and there was a vertical pole that was dropped into the ground well that vertical pole on there you could put the words New Testament on the new pole that's the New Testament that's the pillar and ground and foundation up at the cross that Jesus was hung on what happened at the cross what was nailed to the cross pardon yeah, Christ was nailed to the cross. And think about it this way. That cross was nailed with Jesus' body, and that representation, that representation says Old Testament. Because when Jesus was nailed to the cross, so was the Old Testament, because it was no longer needed other than to train us up to bring us to the time of Christ, as Paul writes in chapter 3 of Galatians. <clears throat> But what we stand on is that pillar of the New Testament that Christ brought to us. And we think about those in illustrations like that, and that helps out. Gene, if you would, I would like to read. For these verses are contained with the people who turn from the faith. And I'm yeah, that's what this is. So this God's is. Go ahead. Spirit, because he says that it's the last day many people will turn from their faith. They will be fooled by evil spirits and by teachings that come from demons. They also will be, fall, be fooled by the false claims of liars whose conscience have lost all feelings. These liars will forbid people to marry or eat certain foods. But God created these foods to be eaten with thankful hearts by his followers who know the truth. Everything God created is good. And if you give thanks, you may eat anything. What God has said and your prayers make it fit to eat. Thank you. Thank you. Those four or five verses right there, Paul's really digging into what Timothy has to combat. And this is, goes back to what Gene was asking earlier about the Spirit. Now the Spirit expressly <clears throat> says that in the latter times some will depart from the faith. What other church did Paul write a letter to very similar to this? There's another letter he put in there very similar to this. First and Second Thessalonians. First and Second Thessalonians he warns against the same thing. And we look at these. But the Spirit is trying to tell and warn Paul, they know, God does, Jesus knows, the Holy Spirit knows, that these are the things that are able and will happen in the future. I put two verses up here, the two versions up here, again, the King James and the New International. The New International is, the Spirit clearly says that in the latter times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Okay. We've got to remember, false teaching comes from one place. That's Satan in the concept of tempting us in what we do. Such teachings come through, yeah, hypocritical liars, okay, in the concept that they once had faith and now they've turned themselves away and now they're lying about things. In some ways, they're doing it for, you know, dishonest gain, uh, popularity. Who knows why they were doing it? But they were teaching it as a false doctrine is what it is. The big key to this thing is down at the bottom of this page down here on the right. It says, God created is good. And that's exactly what we have to remember. Even to the point in verse 5, for it is sanctified by the word of God and 
prayer, those things which are good given to us by God. Falling away and departing from the faith, there were doctrines of demons speaking lies. That's verses 1 and 2. The other verses that we get into, that idea of a hot iron seared, sometimes we don't catch this. The idea he's using here that their words, their concepts were cauterized. They were hard-hearted. Think of Pharaoh trying to release those from Egypt, the Hebrews. But more inclined is the idea of the hot iron used to sear something. Back in the day, if you had a wound back in Paul's day, if you had a cut, how do you think they closed it up? A hot iron. They seared it. They cauterized it. And what Paul is kind of distinguishing he's doing here is the idea that they were cauterized and they were closed up. And they were no longer following God's word. And this is what we see through this type of action. The latter times, the later times, the last days, these things, the time frame we're referring here is basically where it started with the day of Pentecost with the apostles preaching and it ends with the return of Christ. We are in the latter days. We are in those later days as described here that Paul's talking about. We're talking about the church Christian age is what we're in. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. This is where he's writing to the church there. And they had problems seeing all these things occur. And in this verse it says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day, okay, the day that Christ comes, shall not come except, we're, <clears throat> except there are a falling away first. So this is kind of a direct relationship with what Paul's writing here in chapter 4. And that man of sin is revealed. People who do these things. They will be revealed. Okay. The son of perdition is what they refer to it. Who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God. And that is worshipped. So that he as God sits in the temple of God. Showing himself that he is a God. It's simply a description of how men will act in the church is what we're seeing here. And we have to be careful with this because I can guarantee you, we can go out any day of the week, turn the TV on and see some preacher somewhere preaching something about this and they're throwing it off into the abyss. They're not simply following what is written here about how men will act. Absolutely. Yeah, it is how relevant it is even to this day. And that's true. Yeah. I talked to a friend of mine this week, and they were concerned about things going on in the world and everything, and, and all this, and they were getting ready for uh, the apocalypse. Well, their idea of the apocalypse is. Well, let's see, there's a war in Ukraine, and, and we got shortages of food, and the price of everything has gone up, and, you know, what, what should they do to prepare when, when the apocalypse comes? I ain't going to be here. That's right, I ain't going to be here. When the apocalypse comes, that's when Jesus is going to show up, yeah, because there's a return of Christ. I don't have to worry about the apocalypse. I don't have to worry about food prices and stuff. Oh, I can worry about it. My paycheck only goes so far. But God wants us to be smart about what we do, both in life and in the church. That's it. While he's sitting back there looking what? Well, in Matthew chapter 25, I believe that Jesus' apostles asked him about the Jews and the Gentiles and the Jews 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 Because we have to have good concepts. We have to look at these things and get an understanding. Because my 
That's right, iron sharpens iron, that is the key. What I've put up here on the screen, of course, the idea that we have uh, this idea, two false teachings are going to be taught. And he's talking about here in Timothy. Now, this is what he wrote here in this letter. And those two false teachings, one, as it says right here, is somebody's going to forbid marriage. Another one is that abstinence of food. Okay, we can think of a lot of different religions that are out there that do this type of thing and stuff. And I don't even have to name them. They're present in our society to this day. And we have to remember, the Spirit expressly says, in the latter days, these things will happen. And then we look at ourselves and say, okay, did they? Uh, yes, they did. I don't have to worry about it. God says it, and it occurred. Um, so we take these things. In Acts chapter 20, as we read last week, verses 29 and 30, it talks about wolves coming into the church. And the people it is talking about were... Paul reminds the elders that some of you coming from the elders are some of these ravenous wolves. And we have to be careful of that. That's why we have more than one elder in the body of Christ. This is how it's supposed to be. That's how we have more than one pastor. Yeah, more than one. And there's today that have one pastor. Yeah, absolutely. There are sometimes... That is the pattern that God wants us to have. And while he's using the phrase pattern, because it does, it goes into our concept of uh, our conduct. There is a pattern that God wants us to follow. Part of the pattern comes from history. We have to remember this. History, God guides history along too. God is the one who sets up and tears down nations, as the Old Testament says. That is one of those things. And the part that I want to throw out here very quickly is the phrase we use quite a bit. What does the phrase a cappello mean? As the church does. As the church does. So we use that when we talk about singing without instruments. That's, yeah. But the word actually means as the church did or the church does. Because when we look at history, the church that we saw, Peter, James, John, you follow, they established the pattern in which we worship. And that's the pattern we attempt to follow even to this day. Tressa? So when the model says the pattern, I think that encumbers that uh, when they go teach, everybody needs to be doing this. Exactly. Exactly. And that is that's the pattern. It is it. Yeah. And this is why Paul is being so adamant to Timothy that it's the idea of what Paul taught Timothy, Timothy is going to teach the church at Ephesus. And the same thing, what Paul taught to Titus, Titus is going to teach the church at Crete. That's a real important point that you have to make there because we have today canons made by men yes. that are still being taught in the church. He wants God's word taught and spoken about. Anything man comes up with, well, we have this theophilus today, and we have all these creeds and things that men have created that we're supposed to follow. Yeah. And, and that, that is exactly what we see. And we have to be very careful with these things. You know, uh, it, and we have to be, as Christians, we have to be careful how we present this and everything, too, because, you know, it is not the person that we hate, if you will, use that phrase. And I know that's a, that's a big political word now. It's not the, but no, it's, it's the action or the sin that we hate, because we understand God hates sin. So my job is, as Paul is telling Timothy, is to correct false teaching for us, even to this day. So we see these things. And, of course, the scripture here in these verses, you know, God created good things. And we find that at the beginning of the scripture. Genesis chapter 1, verse 10, 12, 18, 21, 24. Anybody tell me what those verses say? Yeah. And God saw that it was good all we need to look at and it's important that we see that because it is and this is what he's talking about is the concept that every verse 4 every creature every created thing is good and we should receive it with thanksgiving and prayer because in verse 5 it says it is sanctified by the word of God and where do we see that for an example and I didn't put all of it up here, but it has down here, these good things should be received with thanksgiving. Acts chapter 10, verse 15. 
What character do we see in Acts chapter 10? Anybody remember? Who's the person illustrated here? Peter. Okay. Peter is there and he's at the tanner's uh, house, Simon the tanner. He's at his house. He's up on the roof and he sees three sheets come down. And they're loaded with what? Food. food. What kind of food? All kinds of unclean animals that he told God, I've never partaken of any of those things. And God says, anything that I've given is not unclean. It is not uncommon. And he's trying to correct a teaching that had been followed by the Old Testament forever. And Paul, or excuse me, Peter had to change his mind about things. Because in verses, chapter 10, verses 34, 35, all of a sudden he's standing at this man's doorway and he looks at Cornelius and says, you know it's unlawful for a Jew to step into a Gentile's house? That was a big change for Peter. But he did it because God says, do not call any man uncommon or unclean. So we have the same illustration of not only food that we have, but people we meet. Because that's how we're supposed to treat people again. That is our conduct. And then they are sanctified by God, his word and prayer. In chapter 17 of John, verse 17, it is the idea that we talk about the truth. And the word of truth is sanctified, is what we have. it. And again, in Ephesians chapter 5, 26, we are sanctified through the word of God. This is what we have, the idea of the, the doctrine that's in the church and the things which we must do. Wally and I were talking this morning. I'm kind of moving along fairly quick here because we never get to the questions. So I'm moving through here a little bit. But in this application, what he has with all these words, there are false teachers going to come. They're going to be out there. They're here with us now. It's what we do. And one thing I, did, I left off and I didn't get back to with Teresa, the idea of the pattern being taught. Because in the scriptures, it's very clearly illustrated. Galatians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. I love this verse. And it is, if anyone teaches you anything different than the gospel in which I taught you, speaking to the churches at Galatia, let him be accursed. And he repeats it in verse 9. If even an angel from heaven teach you something different than in which was the gospel which I preached to you, let him be accursed. And I think he was trying to really emphasize the conduct of the teaching. It is only what the apostles established because in the scriptures, the apostles established the foundation and the pillar and the ground of truth in the teachings of Christ. And that's what Paul is emphasizing. There is only one gospel to be te to taught, and that's what's here. It's not man-made. It's not by false teachers. It is the gospel that's in the New Testament. Yes, Wally? You're talking about the church of Thessalonica before. Also, he also says to that church that the Jesus would come back and judge us that gospel. That's right. To death. Exactly. And we see that across all the New Testament letters. It's repeated more than once. You know, I use that single verse, but it is a concept that there's only one gospel to teach, and we have to teach it. You know, and I can throw out this, and I've, I've done this several times. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 2. The writer there, Moses, he writes and he says, in the simple part of this, do not add to or do not take away from the word of God. And he's telling the people that. He's telling the people there, the, the Jews, the Hebrews that he brought out of Egypt, do not add to, do not take away from the word of God. And then the funny thing is John repeats it at the end of the scriptures Revelation chapter 22, verse 19, I believe it is. You can correct me if I get that wrong. And guess what John writes there? Do not add to or take away from the scriptures as it's written. And these curses would fall upon you that's written in this book if you do. 
I think there's a message there. So when Paul talks about in chapter 4, false teachers and the conduct of the false teachers as opposed to Christians, we have to pay really attention to it. Paul wrote to Timothy to encourage him in his work, and it is written to us for the same work. 1 Thessalonians, we find the same thing. We are to investigate. We give thanks, but we test the spirit of all things. That's what it's there for. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse, two, uh, verse 12, take heed unless you fall. So it's up to us to look at these things and walk the correct walk. If I don't, I could fall from grace. And of course, I read this before, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 40, do everything decently and in order. Decently in order is very important that we carry on. In these things, Matthew wrote in chapter 7, verse 15, and this is Jesus. Beware false prophets. Jesus himself says this. Beware false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravishing wolves. And this is exactly what Paul told the elders of Ephesus in Acts chapter 20. It's the same admonition. And we have to look at it that way. Because he uses the whole thing. They come in sheep's clothing, but yet they are there to tear out the throats of the sheep. And Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, carried away, carried about by every wind of doctrine, by this slight of man, cunning, craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. These two verses between Matthew and Ephesus here, it reminds me what Peter writes, the idea that there is a lion laying in wait to devour us. See, all these admonitions across the scriptures. And 1 Timothy chapter 3, 15. But if I tarry long, that thou may know how that ought to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth. And that's what we have to pay attention to. Any questions before we leave this section? No? Okay. We'll discuss this tomorrow night at Monday Night Bible Class, by the way, if you'd like to join us. I'm sure there'll be more questions to this. Let's talk about the questions here. On page 44 of our lesson, we have uh, six questions here. We're finally getting to this, so just quickly on to it, so I'll take your help here. Question number one is, what did Paul hope to do in verse 14 of chapter 3? Come to, to, to the church there, in there. Verse, or, uh, question number two, why did Paul write his first letter to Timothy? Okay. Those people delayed, they wouldn't know how to behave themselves. Yeah, how to behave themselves, how to conduct themselves in the church, very much. And uh, number three, what did the Spirit say would come, would occur in the last times? Some will depart from the church, or from the night. Yeah. Some will depart from the faith in these latter times is what we have. And then we get into question number four. How did Paul describe the conscience of those who spoke false doctrine? Seared with fire. Yeah. Seared with fire. Something that would close their minds to other things. And number five. What two errors did Paul say would be promoted by the false teachers? Forbid marriage and abstain from marriage, or from foods of certain types. And finally, number six that we have here, what two reasons did Paul give for the, to counter the prohibition of certain foods? Thanksgiving.
and he's sanctified it by the word of God and prayer. These are the things that we are to be encouraged by in the stuff that we work with every day. This is not a Sunday morning, Sunday day thing, correct? Yeah. Tomorrow I get to go to the doctor. How I behave when I go to the doctor reflects on me. And it can reflect on the church, correct? And we have to think about that every time we go out into the world where we teach and where we make contact with people. My job is to spread Christ both by seeing and hearing. That's what we have. I want to thank you all for our lesson and a class today. I appreciate all the comments and everything, and I hope we get something out of the lesson. Next week, we will be looking at uh, Lesson 6, Timothy's Ministry, and we'll continue from there. Thank you again.